I've um, titled this sermon, We Are Made New in Christ. It is, um, it is a working that we're, uh, it, we are working now through what we have spoken about for the last couple of weeks. And we've asked two questions so far. You know, what is the core tenet of being a Christian? We talked about that, servanthood. Now we're going to go to our third question and we're going to fill in the gap of what it means to be in Christ. Last week we talked about what it means to be a Christian. And if you haven't seen what we are, um, what I'm trying to do through this in in my review, um, I'm trying to go from 50,000 feet and work our way down to where we're looking in a mirror where it, 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 it's coming to our hearts. It's not just a conversation that you would have in a Bible study or a theological class, but it becomes something that you look in the mirror and go, this is important. So as I said, we talked about being a godly servant. We talked about being a Christian uh, in, in, in you know, like a 30,000 foot view. And today we start, we start to put the rubber on the road. And, and to be in Christ, Yes, that means to be a Christian, but it goes deeper than that. And next, and this week and next week, we're going to split this up into two conversations. And why is because this week we're going to talk, Paul is going to share with us, uh, well, this week and next week, um, what it means to, to really start digging into what it means to be in Christ. And next week, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm, che- I'm, I'm giving you the answers to the quiz up front. Next week, I'm going to ask you a question. There's going to be two, but I'm going to give you the first question this week. I'm going to ask you this question. Who are you? So I want you to think about that this week. And I already said it out loud. So every time you wake up, every time you walk down the hallway, every time you go to work, you're going to be asking that question. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And you should, because this follow-up question, that's the easy question. But next week, when we dig into Ephesians, we're going to answer the second question, which I'm not going to give you today. But I will offer it to you at the beginning of the sermon next week. Now, after that, we're going to we're going to take everything we've learned about being individual Christians. And we're going to start talking about what that looks like collectively as a church. And then what I hope is to to finish off with the question is, why do we do this? Why Christian? Why being a Christian? Why Christianity? Why? Is it because we grew up in the South? Because our grandparents were Baptists? We live in the West? I don't think any of those are the answers. And I, I, I think it's an important question to ask. I think it's even a more important question to answer. Now, we have to build some context today when it comes to uh, these verses. And, and, and on the surface, you might think, now it's pretty clear. I, pretty much know what's going on. But I want to ask you a question. I put it up on the on the screen. It says, do, do you remember what it was like to be a new Christian? Now, I know most of you, and I've talked to most of you. I think um, I think most of you came out of the, to- out of the tomb, Ugh. out of the womb, heading to the tomb, see, uh, singing how great thou art. Uh, most of you have grown up in the faith, and God bless you for it. And then there's uh, ugly Christians like me who who discovered Jesus at 30. But I remember what it's like to be a new Christian. And even if you grew up in a Christian family, there is that moment in time when it gets real. When it's not your father's faith or your grandparents' faith or your mom's faith. It's yours. And we, we forget that. But when Paul is writing to, he's writing to the, a, a group of people, if you will, that are brand new Christians. They are, they're not even called Christians at this point, they're of the way. It, the, the, the title Christian at that time was not, was not a badge of honor, it was an insult. But these people, mostly Jews and Gentiles who understood the, the life of the Jewish culture, are hearing phrases like born again. Redeemed, reconciliation, justified. These are all new words to them. And and even to us, if I throw these out there, most of us go, I've I've heard that. I I actually studied that. I I think I might know what that means. But for the most part, when we're brand new, we're confused. We hear people say, oh, I'm redeemed and five-point Calvinists. And and, uh, we throw all these terms out there and they nod and they smile because they have no clue to what we're talking about. 
And we, over the years, absorb these things, and we know it dispensational and, and hermeneutic. And we, we get all these things as time goes by. But you have to remember, Paul is writing this letter with a purpose to them, and they're brand new. And the reason I share that with you is because the influence of the culture of that time, the Romans, the Greeks, the, and remember, most of these were Jews. This has all been flipped in a day. Well, in a weekend. Christ changed everything that they knew for thousands of years. Moses didn't come along and give the Mosaic law out, you know, three weeks earlier. And then someone else came and gave another. This has been all they know for generations. So as I read the scripture again to you, keep that in mind. All they have experienced is this sacrificial system. And, and while the Romans and the Greeks and the Jews, oh my, are all influencing these people, either philosophically or through government, the one thing, the last thing I put up there is, it's mind blowing to them. We wouldn't understand it. It is East versus West. It is right versus wrong. It is left versus right to them. It is something they never experienced. And that's relationship with God. The name they used for God, Yahweh, wasn't even spoken. This was a, a distant factor. A, a, a someone who, who, who could only be feared. And in a weekend, from the cross to the grave, to the resurrection, Jesus changed all of that and said, I want to know you. I don't want to be, I want to sit with you. I want to experience you. I, and what Paul shares with this, with us today is exactly, is exactly how that was done. And with a phrase we use today is because of what Paul shares with us, we are in Christ. So let's read the scriptures here one more time for now on, for now on, therefore, and it's therefore because it means something. Paul's trying to get their attention. He says, without regard to uh, no one accounting, I'm sorry, according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he is, we are, a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this from God. Let me read that again. All this from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses, their sins against them, and we entrusting to us and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are now ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you, we beg, we, we implore you on the behalf of Jesus Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, I hope with that context in mind, imagine being a new creation, a new cre a Christian and hearing that. That is completely left of what they have ever experienced. To be made right with God was a complicated process, was, was layered with systematic duties and actions to make things right with God. And what Paul is telling us here is that it wasn't about us being right with God. It was about God being right with us. They just got the direction wrong. And if we're honest, we still do today. So I have four points, four goals, four points I want to share with you. I'm going to give them to you up front so that you can think about them as we work through them. I will give them again at the end, and maybe you look at these differently. The first point I want to bring out that we can find in this set of scriptures is that you are new in Christ. I think Paul says about four times. That's good. You are new in Christ. What does that mean? What does it really mean? We're going to talk about that. The other second is, if you're new, then what do you do with the old? Well, the old is gone. So my second point is, the old you is gone. We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to speak about being redeemed. You've been redeemed. 
We're going to define that clearly. And the last point I want to bring up today is it's not for you alone. It's not just about you. And we're going to bring that up. So let's tackle the first point. You are new in Christ. Um, I, I like... I like to, to use different versions of the Bible, and it's not because I think one is all way better than the other. If you're in a position like mine, there are some Bibles you just step away from um, because I, I don't think they're accurate. And then there are other ones we, we tackle because they just say the same thing in a clear way, especially in today's culture. I use the CSB often, uh, the Christian Standard Bible, and that first line when we talk about spiritual, it, it gets a little confusing. So let me share with you my version, my Bible's version um, from that first line. It says, from now on then, do we not know anyone from the worldly perspective, even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective? So when he talks about the flesh, it, it, it is a difference in attitude or a difference in knowledge between what Christ was when he walked this earth and what now he is to us after his ascension. And it's important to know that because that comparison is used for us as well. As we tackle through this, when we say we are different, we are new, we, we look at the, the, the Greek word kani here and, and it's not just you're new. You know, I bought a new pair of shoes. Why? Because my old ones are old. I got a new t-shirt. Why? Because the old one wore out. That's not what, this is not new and old like that. This is new in a very deep and methodical way. It, it, it has purpose. The, the, word, it, it, the words that define it, you can see it, it means to be previously on, it was previously unknown. That means what you are now, no one knew before. It was previously unheard of. It's been giving, it's a new creation given, and this is the key, with authority. That means the one who changed it was the only one who could and should change it. So when we look at this new version of us, it is given with authority. It, as I wrote this out, it reminded me of a time, um, PJ and I were just married, I had just become a Christian. As you guys know me well enough to know, I'm pretty extreme in things. You know, I don't build little gardens, I build big gardens. I, I, I just, everything is big. So I became a Christian and of course right away, the most sensible thing I could do is, <laughs> I just wanna be a pastor now. It just boom, right out there. And I got a phone call from someone I knew from school and, and the military and, and we spent about 15 minutes, actually longer than that. He listened to me ramble on, which you know, I typically never do. And I'm rambling on about getting married, and, and we had a kid on the way. And that was a long time ago because our kid just got married, and she's away. And so that's how long ago it was. And I talked about the new house we bought, our first home. I talked about becoming a Christian and how that changed my life. Now I'm talking about wanting to be a pastor. I rambled on for 20 minutes, and this guy looked right at me, looked right at me, spoke to me, and said, this is all you could come up with, dear friend. You're a Christian? <laughs> you, I'm trying to admit, I'm not, I'm not making this up. This isn't me, this is him. <laughs> you want to be a what? A pastor? You? And, and then just to put emphasis, he went, really? I talked about having a baby, getting married, new home. You see, I, I don't know if you've ever been there before. I don't know if maybe when you went off to college, you kind of stepped away from your faith. Maybe you showed something to somebody that just wasn't a real reflection of Jesus. And you just, you know, you wish you had that magic eraser. And you could just kind of, you know, put it down here and shut the door. Nobody sees that. Coming to Christian at 30, I had quite a few moments like that. And maybe you have too. But... I shared that as I read, as I read this and, and I, I did the study and, and it says, it's, I, I'm a new creation, done so with authority. Well, all I can do is look at him and say, I'm not the same guy I was. Christ changed me. And that's what that new creation idea comes from. It's referencing the results of God's activity. Now, if you take anything from what I give you today, that's what I want you to take, that you are new because, listen to me, 
God wanted to make you new. He, He, Creator, Lord, Savior, chose you and wanted to make you new. And you heard me preach last week that he doesn't make changes without purpose. So you have a purpose. And we are made new by God alone. And, and, and in that, in that, he prepares us. He has readied us to be reconciled with him. Now, that's a big word. It's a complicated word. We throw it around seminary all the time and we write papers on it. Think about it this way. Have you ever been in kind of a bad position with somebody? You ever make someone angry? Or someone made you angry, of course. Hurt your feelings? Brother or sister, family member, someone who kind of rubbed you the wrong way, did something that you would never do, right? Or maybe it's you and you reverse the roles. When you reconcile with someone, is that based on you or them? If they wronged you, Nothing happens until you say, okay, I'm willing to kind of put this behind us. So reconciliation involves two people, two parties, certainly. But no matter how you feel, if you've wronged someone, you need that second half to look at you and go, I want to fix this with you. That's the simplest way to look at reconciliation. That God looked at us and said, I want I want to be right. I want things to be right between us. And he couldn't do that until we were made new. I think C.S. Lewis did a great job with this. Uh, and I put the quote up there. Um, I share it with you today. The problem of reconcili reconciling human suffering with the existence of God who loves is only insoluble so long as we attach a trivial meaning to the word love. See, when God says he loves us, and we go, yeah, yeah, do we really know what that means? Do we take the depth and breach, a breach of, that, of that meaning to heart? See, God made it right with us. He wasn't bored. It wasn't an off day. He had nothing to do. It wasn't day eight. He did so because he wanted to. And the only thing that holds us back from that reconciliation, it's not God. It's our weak definition of the love he has for us. But that's not the only thing we do. We, 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 we do become new, but what do we do with the old? What, what happens with that? And that's our second point that we're going to be talking with today, about today. Is God's the reconciliator, so, so reconciliator. He's the one who reconciles. You see, his new replaces are old. And you think, well, wait a minute. You now, Sean, I, I kind of screwed up yesterday. I still tackle that sin in my life. My soul is difficult. Well, let me put your mind to rest. You will sin until the day you die. And you will fight sin until the day you die. Until you, or until he calls us home, which I'd be happy with. I'd just as soon do that. I'd love to be there with all of you, but until we're called home, until we are given our new body, until we are actually in a position, as the Bible tells us, where not only will we not want to sin, we will be physically unable to do so. But until that day, we're stuck here. Now, I love being stuck here with you guys, but we're stuck here. And this is the world. And the world still has influence on us. We turn on TVs, we answer phones, we go places, we talk to people. I don't know how you avoid that. So the world is still coming at us. And we are not made perfect here. But when he talks about being made new and replacing, what he's really talking about, the, the term that's used means a new species. It, it means something that wasn't there before that, we, that we've discovered. So when the old is gone... When it's gone, it's not just a newer version of the old. It's something completely different. And if you look, you, know, you look at verse 20 and we see the old must be gone, okay. But why is it? I'd love to blame the world. I just did a little bit. But the truth of it is, we love our sin. We do. We hate it and love it all at the same time. It turns our stomach. But man, we keep knocking on that door. 
We do. And it's not just big stuff. It's small stuff. It's everyday stuff. It's stuff that we just kind of shake our head and, and, and we just go, why? Why do I keep doing this? Well, when God gives us, he creates us as new, he's creating something completely different that was never there before. So the old is, is, is tossed away. There's no room for it anymore. If you picture your heart in God, and when God comes into our heart, do you remember when you were a Christian, that passion you had? Do you remember the love you had? Just the, oh, just, it, it just overwhelmed you. See, if you ask people like us, people who have been doing this for a long time, especially theology, theological students, the theology of some level, uh, we give you answers to why we love God. And, and we quote verse in scripture, and, and that's all very good. But when you talk to someone who just became a Christian, and you ask them about it, it's almost goofy. Oh, I just love him. Oh, he loves me. I love him. Well, oh, I just love him. And that's it. Well, why did you become a Christian? Well, it's God. And you get excited about it. But, but then that sin knocks on our door again. And as we go deeper with God, it's a, it's a back and forth until the day that he makes us completely new. But that's the old of this world that calls to us. See, Paul uses this word pleading. He pleads for us to reconcile. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. This is an interesting word. Um, I don't want to Greek you to death today. But this isn't, hey, you know, Grace, will you come on with me? PJ, we're going this way. You want to come this way? It's, it's not a request. It's not like that. It's it's to exhort, it's to beg, it's to counsel. You have to do this to influence. It's a noun that's tightly associated with the Holy Spirit. It, it's within us. It, it is a calling we can't ignore. Now, whether we choose it or not is another thing. But this is the voice that you cannot not hear. And Paul is telling them, he is begging them, Open up your hearts. God is coming. He wants to reconcile with you. Embrace that. Accept that. And, and the truth of it is we must be willing to trust him. To, to reconcile with God is, is, to, is, is suddenly to be in a position where in Christ, on behalf of Christ, to turn to Christ, through Christ, for Christ. On behalf, it's all about him. It's all about him now working through us. And that door can't be opened until you open it. I'm not telling you here today, for, the, for those who might think, well, you mean we have a, a role in salvation? That's not what I'm talking about here today. And the answer is no. You don't. Can you turn it away? I would argue that you have a heart now. If you love Christ, he has given you a heart to love him. I don't know how you undo that. But to be reconciled with him, to, to open that door, to be made right with him. He'll do all the work, but he still gives us the free will to be able to open that door and to fix that with him. It's important. I think, um, I think Paul also addresses this in Romans 6, 4. See, therefore, we were buried with him and by baptism into death in order that, in order that, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. I don't know if you understand this, but you, 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 I hope you do. This is new to me. We are not like Christ. We, we're not similar to him. In the eyes of the Father, he has made us like Christ. He sees him when he sees you. It's one and the same. God didn't make us kind of better than what we are. He made us like Christ. And when we talk about being in Christ, that's what it means. But you get everything. You get the challenges. You get the things that Christ told us would come. By his namesake, you will be challenged. People who you love, people you know, people who would never do anything wrong to you will challenge you just like they did to Jesus. We get the whole package. If you remember the movie Aladdin, I don't have this in my notes, don't look for them. Uh, towards the end of the movie, this bad guy wants all the power. 
and he gets it. But you guys all know where genies live, right? Little lamps. And as this bad guy gets all the power, it's announced to him that, yeah, you've got all the power, but you get the little itty bitty living space too. And poof. now that's, that's just symbolic of what this is. That's just from a movie. But in reality, we get everything that God promised us through Christ because we are in him. And in that, we have what we would call is new. And that leads us to the word redeemed. That's our third point. So how can God do this? If you study the Bible for more than 30 seconds, you realize that God is a just God. There is no left and right with God. There is no middle of the road. There is no gray. He doesn't bend. He is not willing to negotiate with us. If he's done that with you, whew, you're a better person than me. I, I try all the time. I've sent memos going, hey, just my thoughts, God. He doesn't answer them. Now, he, job evaluation, God doesn't care. He is God and I am not. So how could God do this? If you're a sinner and I'm a sinner and I'm broken and you're broken, how can a just God balance these scales? Because he is a just God. And because of that, he knows that we're unreconcilable with him. But we, we have no ability, none on our own, because one sin is one too many. I, I, I don't care how big and ugly your sin is, doesn't matter. If you have one sin, tell a little white lie, you sinned. And God cannot do that, or you cannot do that. But only God can. And that's where we introduce the term of substitution. It, 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 in, in academic worlds, we call it the doctrine of substitution. I don't mean to make light of it. It's very important. But only God could do this. This is the ultimate. I'm going to roll up the sleeves. And when you want it done right, do it yourself. Because that's exactly what God did. God knew that you were important enough and knew that you could do nothing to justify that. So, I don't usually share all the details of my notes um, when I'm preaching. You certainly have access to them. But I put this in, in here because it hit me when I wrote it and it hurt, hit me when I read it. And I share it with you because this is what substitution is. God killed Jesus with his wrath over your sin. Let me read that again. God killed Jesus. He allowed him to die with his wrath over your sin as if he lived your life. Now to us, you all have secrets. We all do. We have the closet we hide things in. We have the little drawer that we leave locked. There are things we don't talk about from when we were 15. But God knows all those things. And he put them all on Jesus. Why? Because the only way to make this right is to substitute a man who had no, no reason to be on the cross. None. He had no reason to be beaten. He had no reason at all to take on anything that you and I would put on his shoulders. And he did. And because of that, it's been justified. Not because of you. The only thing you bring to the table, the only thing I bring to the table is the sin. Everything else is on behalf of God. See, the price was paid, not, not just by us. And how can we do that? How can that happen? How can we do it? The only way it can happen is because God chose to do it. While we may, as humans, want to take some credit some idea that we had some role in our salvation in, in being reconciled. We said or did something that was so good that even God said, let's make it right with him or her. And there's nothing we can do. And this is what Paul is telling these brand new Christians. Stop. The reason you're going to be reconciled, the reason I plead you to do so with God is because he wanted it first. 
that leads us to a, a quote I wanted to share with you from Paul Tripp. I like Paul. Um, he he, he kind of tells it how it is. If you ever listen to his sermons, he, he's, he's pretty straightforward. He shares here, the cross guarantees that even in your darkest moment, God will never turn in disgust and walk away. Whew. That's hard to read. It is. He goes on. There is no rebellion, no weakness, no foolishness, no evil of heart that the cross can't defeat. Get this. And the grace can't transform. Let me read that last part again. There is no evil of heart that the cross can't defeat and grace can't transform. If you know a new Christian or someone who's thinking about becoming a Christian, or if you're here today and on the outside you, you look right, but inside you're battling, I want you to pull this back up and read it later. Share it with somebody. Because that's what reconciliation is. It's the first step to being transformed in God all because he loves you enough to have that relationship with you. But, and this is our fourth point, it's not for you alone. If we would look, especially at the ending of these scriptures, it's pretty straightforward. He asks us to be ambassadors for Christ. See, when we're transformed, we have purpose. I go back to a sermon I did a while ago on, on Peter's reconciliation with Jesus after denying him three times. Why did he do it? He didn't have to forgive Peter. He just didn't have to. The world didn't stop changing. I mean, it kept rotating. The, the world at that time probably didn't even recognize or care about that. 2,000 years later, we're still talking about it. Why did he do it? Because he had a purpose for him. See, an ambassador for Christ, those are... He, Paul could have said a lot of things. He could have chosen a lot of words. He chose this word for ambassador on purpose, I'm sure. And the reason he did this is because of what the ambassador, the word ambassador means. It means to act in the interest of the one who sent you. If I'm the ambassador of America and I go to visit France, I don't go there to, to do anything to try to influence France other than to show them I go and say, this is what America is. Why? Because that's who sent me. This is what we are. Now, we have to admit, Americans can be a little arrogant, so we... We, we stand firm on what we believe, but we do so. And if I'm an ambassador anywhere in this world, and we are when we travel, we represent the one who sent us, our country. The same is true in this when Paul says, you represent the Christ that sent you. Get this, when we're reconciled, God doesn't just make things right and send us on our way. He uses us. And Paul shares that with us. He says, look, you are to give a message, one of hope and peace. Why? Because we're at war with God when we don't know God. When we're not right with God, we are his enemy. Let me, let me say that again, because if, if, if it seems profound, it, it shouldn't be. But when we have sin in our lives, and it's not justified, if, we, if, if, if Christ sees us, I'm sorry, if God sees us and not Christ, we're the enemy. But because of what Christ did for us and how God chose to re reconcile with us, we, we, now, we now have a responsibility to offer a message of hope and peace. See, we don't want to be at war anymore with God and not as anybody else. And we're there to give that message. You see, we're born again. We're regenerated. We're a new creature. And our goal is to display that. To the world it drives me crazy maybe it's just because i'm old now now nah, it bothered me when i was 20 something too it drives me crazy when people go i just don't know what to do with my life what's my purpose look if you ask that question you know, today i'm not mocking you i'm not it, it it's just a silly question for those of us who claim to be christians why this is our purpose this is it we are made new in Christ so that we may share the message of reconciliation. That God wants to be right with us. That's it. You want to display in your life the grace that God showed you 
to give to others. Do you need some fancy way on how to talk to people about Christ? No. Are there better ways to do it than others? Yes, there are. You know, uh, Thor is pretty good at hammering stuff. He's not really good at talking to people. You know, you, do you want to be a Thor? No, probably not. Are there times to be firm? Yes. Are there times to be gentle? Of course. But the point is, all you have to do is show the grace in your life. Yeah, you can use words if you have to, but you don't. People will see your life. You'll be going through cancer, a, a battle with cancer, for say, for an example. And you will still find joy. You will still trust in God. And people go, how can you do that? That's what opens that door. Just tell them your life and live your life accordingly so that you have something to tell. Grace will do it. See, if we are to continue in him, as I have written up here, we become a tool of his righteousness. You're not a minion. You're not just somebody that God had a job for. You are his created, saved, reconciled child that he loves and he's looking for you, you, you and me to share that with the world. God never asked us to tell people to be like you or me. They tell them to be like Christ. We just need to set up the introduction. And that's what our purpose is here. I want to share a quote with you. It's a mix of my notes, and we'll finish up here. Um, I, I think I did a pretty good job putting it all together. So <laughs> it sounded like one sentence. But why I put this up here is because many of you have asked me for copies of my notes. And um, I want to, this quote hit me. This kind of summed it up well with me. It says, Christians are God's ambassadors and that they have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. I got that from 1 Thessalonians. As we go through the world, we represent another kingdom. We all know that. We're not of this world. John 18. And it's our responsibility to reflect the official position of heaven. We're ambassadors. We are in this world, but not of this world. John 17. God's ambassadors are to be a shrewd and as snake and innocent as doves. That's Matthew 10. Empowered with the Holy Spirit, we must take the message of the king, of our king, to the ends of the work of the world, to the earth. Acts 1 8, and we all know that great command, imploring men and women everywhere to be reconciled with God. I think I'm gonna hang on to this one because it's a great summary of what we should do. Next time someone says, What's my purpose in this world? You have my permission. Give it to them. I stole this from everybody else, anyways. And you should. You should give it to them because that is our purpose. So, I, I told you that I would ask you four questions, or we would bring up four points. The first one is, are you new in Christ? You are. With purpose. The old you is gone. Yes. Is it perfected yet? No. But there is no room in your heart for anybody else besides God. None. That's how he designed us originally. And then you have been redeemed. You have been reconciled. And if you take anything, if I lost you, wake up, come on back. If you take anything away from this today, this is what I want you to take away. It's because he chose to reconcile with you. He wanted to do it with you, with me. And it's not for you alone. Your purpose, my purpose, all of our purposes is to share that message that Paul talks about, especially in that last verse, where he begs us to get right with God so that we may get help others be right with God. So the question I have for you that I want you to think about this week, because I already gave you some homework. I'm going to remind you just so you're reminded, is you need to ask the question, who are you? But as you go through your day today, I really want you to ask the question, am I in Christ? Do you understand what he has done for you, for me, for all of us? So much so, will you share it with somebody? So much so that you can't help but to share it with somebody. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your message of reconciliation. God, we openly admit that if we designed this ourselves, if, we, if you gave us an outline and said, hey, 
design something that will make it right between you and me. We, 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 we never would have thought of the cross or your son. We never thought that you would come to us and make things right. We would have had a five-point bullet plan that we put before you and hoped that it would be the easiest and less painful way, and what you did for us is just the opposite. You did so so that our reconciliation with you is permanent, and we thank you for that. You did so so that we may share it with others. That's challenging, Lord, for many of us. Please give us hearts that just can't help but talk about the grace and the actions that you've taken in our own lives that you want to do so with others. We don't always get it, God, so give us a heart on fire and an understanding that, that we don't have to understand it all, that we trust you completely. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you. Wow, we thank you for your son. We thank you for the cross. And we thank you, Lord, most of all, that you love us enough to want to be right with us. It's in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen.